Okay, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to Imbiasis Webinar Lecture Series 7 in 2022. I am Dr. Imelda, your moderator for today's webinar. I hope the video that we played just now has provided you with some background of Imbiasis. So for those who are interested to collaborate with us, you are most welcome to do so. Feel free to browse in by this website and social media for the latest updates and information. I feel so grateful today that all of us are granted good health and time to attend our webinar series. So far, this is our seventh webinar series for this year. There will be many more webinars to come and I hope all of you will join again in the future. Imbiasis webinar series was established and started in 2021 for the purpose to provide a knowledge and research experience sharing platform to ensure we were still connected with each other and stay motivated in our research during the pandemic. And we still continue this webinar because of the support that we obtain from our past webinars. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our honorable speaker for today, Associate Professor Dr. Goh Ho Han from Imbiasis. Allow me to share with you Dr. Goh's CV. Okay, so Associate Professor Dr. Goh is a plant molecular biologist who obtained his PhD from the University of Sheffield, United Kingdom in 2011 before starting his first academic position at the Imbiasis of Systems Biology, sorry, at the Institute of Systems Biology, UKM. Upon joining Imbiasis, he pioneered the, the Plant Functional Genomic Research Group, focusing on the molecular exploration of tropical plants and crop improvement using the functional genomics approaches. Some of the tropical plant species included uh, are Kesom, Ketom, Rafflesia, and Nepenthes feature plants, as well as important crops such as mangosteen, papaya, rice, tomato, and also oil palm. His group has published over 70 index journal articles in reputable journals and seven books with a Google Scholar H index of 15 and 668 citations. He also actively contributing op-eds as a columnist for New Straits Times. Dr. Goh's expertise in functional genomics has been recognized as a regular invited speaker at international conferences and participating in national roundtable discussions. He also conducted various seminars, workshops on qPCR, transcriptomics, and also proteomics. A total of seven PhD and 15 master science students have graduated from his group. He was a visiting researcher at the National Institute of Genetics and IG Japan in 2018. Dr. Go has been actively involved in institutional management. From June 2014, he was the head of Center for Plant Biotechnology who contributed to the commissioning of the first PC2 certified greenhouse at UKM before becoming the head of Center for Bioinformatics Research from 2016 to 2019, where he established the Center of Omics Data Analysis, which in short called CODA, as a one-stop service provider for omics analysis. He was then appointed as the lab manager until September 2020 and initiated an online consolidated lab management system and laboratory one-stop information corner or in short OIC with all the lab officers here in Inbiosis. Currently, he is the head of quality assurance who oversees the quality management at Inbiosis. Uh, with that, let us welcome Dr. Go to share his experience with us. The floor is yours, Go. Okay, thank you, Dr. Imelda. Can you hear me? Yes. So yeah. thank you again for the kind introduction. Uh, please allow me to uh, turn off the video during the presentations today 
uh, because uh, to avoid overlapping uh, on the slide uh, during the Facebook Live. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't have the background because I'm using the Mac and it's incompatible to use a virtual background. Sorry about that. So um, today, um, I'm basically going to talk about the uh, uh, plant function genomic, mainly focusing on the tropical plants and um, trying to lead from the themes of uh, pandemic to until translational uh, application. So I'll stop my video and I'll continue with the presentations. Okay, so um, what is functional genomics? It's basically the study of how the genome contribute to different biological processes. And this mainly focusing on the interaction between the gene, protein, and uh, metabolite, how this interaction contribute to a particular phenotype. And why we use uh, panomics, which is uh, also known as multi-omics. So uh, because at different level or molecular uh, level, you have uh, different complexity from the genome, gene sequences, uh, which is regulated by alternative um, transcription start site with a different uh, isoform until RNA processing to uh, translation into different protein. Even at the protein level, you have these cross-translational modifications and the interaction between the proteins and the resulting metabolite is what makes a phenotype or molecular functions. So therefore, to truly understand a uh, biological system holistically, we need a multi-omics approach. So there are various ways to integrate the different multi-omics from the elemental base, just simple correlation or cluster or multivariate analysis to all the way to the pathway mapping until the genome scale analysis. Uh, for further detail, you can refer to this publication to review. And today, um, First, I'm going to share with you some of the research at Embalsis as an overview. Then I'm going to tell um, the story based on the three plants that I work on, Casome, Nepenthes, and also Mangosteen, if I have time. So that depends on the time limitation. But just start with Embalsis. So uh, Embalsis, we focusing on a lot of omics research. To integrate these different omics to review the biology of plants and microbes, but also some of the fellows also work with human uh, biomedical uh, research. So um, at this stage in time, we are trying to integrate between system biology and synthetic biology with the knowledge we gain from the different omics. And uh, to put into perspective, we have the computational system biology and the synthetic biology uh, towards the translational research, apart from our in vitro um, uh, platform with uh, structural biology study. So we want to uh, generate new knowledge and this discovery of the frontiers through the computational research, through the different omics, as well as the latest modern biotechnologies in genetic engineering based on our local phytoomicceutical resources. Okay, so to summarize, we apply system biology approach for crop improvement and molecular exploration of tropical plants and microbes using different omics and a different platform in the modern biotechnology. Uh, in the framework of the latest 1010 my STIE towards uh, commercialization and innovations uh, via translational research. So at Embalsis, we have uh, the bioscience technology. So we are contributing towards the environment and biodiversity, the agriculture, forestry, as well as the medical and healthcare which cover the four different uh, sustainable development goals by the United Nations. And this is for under two different research cluster in, in, uh, at UKM. So uh, the research framework that we use span across system and synthetic biology with the integration of the true computational biology from different omics towards the understanding of the whole system leading towards the bioengineering or metabolic engineering. Okay, so there are various plants that we work on for the biomolecular discovery uh, and also the crop improvement as well as other interesting like um, aquatic, um, like this grouper diseases and also this pest of oil palm. So these are the various kind of organisms we work at, uh, at Embalsis. So the first part of this talk will be on the Kersom. What is Kersom? 
Kusong is the, actually the Vietnamese coriander in Malaysia. Yeah, Kusong is the, um, the, the local name. And it's also, the scientific name is Polygon Minus, also known as Persicara Minor. Persicara Minor is actually the latest name, but I tend to like to use Polygon Minus since the beginning. And the project already started uh, at the time of um, the establishment of the Institute of System Biology by uh, Prof. Norma from the beginning, the founder. And it was started five years before I even joined in biosis. So uh, the most of the study that I cover in this talk are actually the research from the past 10 years since I joined in biosis in 2012. So uh, throughout the time of uh, the start of the, this flagship project of Kersung uh, in biosis, it has gone from um, from EST library all the way to the next, uh, next generation sequencing and until now towards the metabolic uh, engineering in yeast already. So uh, so, some of this were already presented by Dr. Ai in the previous uh, webinar. So you can refer back to her talk on it. So why we are interested in this plant as the flagship, just to recap, because it's one of the plants with a uh, high secondary metabolite we give off the pungent smell and make it into the famous dish of laksa for the uh, characteristic taste. And apart from that, it also has the um, phytomedicine value to treat dandruff as well as diarrhea or stomach discomfort. So it's rich in a lot of flavonoids that are important as antioxidant. And also Dr. I have found that it has uh, anti-reverse transcriptase activity also good for neurodegenerative diseases. So the work is still ongoing. So let me just touch on some of the work I, uh, I was involved with since the joining in Basis. So when I first joined, actually I uh, tagged along with Dr. Ayn group in metabolomics and I helped out with uh, her students working on establishing the FDIR technology for discriminating between the different plant samples from different population as well as studying the temperature effect from a control experiment uh, for how the temperature affected the uh, composition of the metabol uh, metabolite pro uh, profile in the leaf of Kersum. So we can see some of the characteristic compounds like carophyllene, farnesine, also decana and dodecana actually strongly affected by the temperature treatment. And in terms of transcriptomic, which is my specialization, uh, I, was, uh, I also started with Kersum. At that time, uh, we have the data actually from um, 454 sequencing. And also we have generated new data at that time using Illumina. At that time, still quite expensive to do transcriptomic. So we don't have much replicate. So this is the first study that we try to improve the sequence database that we have with Gersum at that time. And we combined the analysis from a different platform and generated as a reference for, uh, for Gersum. And we mapped to the pathway and you can see that compared to the previous EST library, we filled a lot of gap in the pathway. Okay, and this work um, was uh, further advanced by um, another student of uh, Prof. Norma, uh, PhD student Rehane, on studying the transcriptomic and metabolomic profiling of uh, metal jasmine induction in the leaf also. So for your, uh, for your information, metal jasmine is like an elicitor, like a stress elicitor to, um, to induce stress in the plant. Usually secondary metabolite are produced as a defense mechanism against stress. Hence, uh, this study was performed to see how uh, the elicitor method just may affect the composition of the transcript as well as the metabolites. As we can see, during the induction or elicitation with the method just may, the first day, you can see the great changes in the volatile compound like the green leaf volatile and monotopin all highly increased on the first day, but it's rapidly uh, decreased the changes later on, on day three and day five. Okay, you can see in the terpene as well, it's highly induced by the elicitor. And we proceed further to look at the transcriptional changes 
and we noticed that it's highly correlated between the uh, induction of the transcript as well as the in, uh, the changes in the uh, metabolite, especially in the terpene biosynthesis. We also proceed on proteomic profiling uh, with uh, the help of Dr. Isaac, and we found that the significantly down-regulated protein actually are not uh, correlated with the changes in the transcript. Tran tran transcript. Hence, the down-regulation of the protein actually is due to the uh, post-transcriptional regulation probably by protein degradation rather than control at the transcriptional level. Apart from that, um, um, the group also interested in the fragrance compound. They are characteristic for the kasum, and this work is uh, led by Dr. Ayn. And you can see that some of the characteristic, characteristic uh, um, orders of the custom, like for example, the pungent, woody, and citrus, as well as green, are mainly responsible by uh, the canal, like I mentioned just now, the de canal, and some of the farnesol. And the student actually found some uh, one new cysterpene synthase genes and managed to overexpress it and uh, produce uh, some of the cysterpene from the genes itself. So for your information, uh, to characterize the, the fragrance, you use this GCMS olfactometric approach and also known as the electronic nose, e nose. And we have this at Imbiosis. If you are interested, you can get in touch with Dr. Ai. Okay. And downstream of that, towards the translational, we need to um, produce something, the compound. So we move on to the engineering of uh, uh, the, the flavonoid in yeast. And this work was done in collaboration with U UPM group, Dr. Suryana, and there's a master student working on that on the uh, part of the pathway. And in Ibiasis, we have the PhD student, uh, Atma, working on another part of it together with Dr. Basli. And we try to produce a compound, and this work are also in progress. Okay, so now the second part of the work which is on the botanical cover carnivory, the Nepenthes. So I work a lot on Nepenthes. And this work also is a follow-up from Prof. Norma's uh, work in the past. When you are talking about botanical carnivory, you thought about this like little show of horror, which is characteristic of the like uh, plant-eating human in the 1980s something. Until now, it's still very popular in the Broadway musical, I believe. Actually, in real life, um, there are a lot of researchers are interested and keen on carnivorous plants due to their very special characteristic. And you can refer to this uh, nice book. The latest textbook would be this from Oxford uh, uh, Publisher. And you can learn more from that. And from my literature review, I noticed there's actually a three different um, type of research with carnivorous plants from the basic involving systematic botanical evolution, ecology, developmental of the carnivore organ to omics discovery, to apply into biomimetics materials for bioengineering, for plant-made protein, as well as bioactivity of the compound from the uh, plant itself, to translational or biomimicry, uh, commercially useful enzyme, and also to crop improvement for stress resistance. So um, they are actually comprising a diverse family of uh, carnivorous plants in this. And they are mainly um, that the characteristic that define a carnivorous plant is first they need to be able to capture and kill the prey. Secondly, they have the ability to digest the prey that they capture then they have, can absorb the nutrient and utilize the nutrient from the prey. So these are the three main requirements to be defined as carnivorous plant. There are actually over 800 species that independently evolve this characteristic over seven times. And they have different kind of traps. Some of them are active, like for example, this 
you see is um it's not so active it's more like a mechanical uh way of and this one also it's actually all because of biomechanic itself rather than um it is actively moving like human same for this this is because of calcium signaling of the venous side trap and how the biomechanic of the leaf itself that's fascinate researcher and the one i'm keen on are this actually this very passive pitfall trap or pitcher plant they are also from different families the one in malaysia are known as the tropical pitcher plant nepenthes but there are other other family like cephalotus from the australia Thalassemia from the america so the diverse family of this pitfall trap um, and the one that is most species rich actually are the nepenthes in the tropical region the borneo uh, and indonesia uh, and all the surrounding bornean country okay so they are fascinating in the sense that they can have different functions that are unknown to us like for example it can have the morphology the diverse morphology for different function the shape by lantern actually help to attract uh, the prey into it with the light and it can also try to attract the rodent to pull inside to utilize the waste for nitrogen not just trying to trap insect to digest them but also directly get the waste from the road, small animals and surprisingly they are very very effective in trapping prey you can see this it and it is because of the attraction from this fluorescent in the opening when uh, there's an a work done that you, when you cover the opening the, the trap trapping efficiency drop a lot otherwise you can see how much you can trap just a simple passive trap you can actually get so many insects into the picture okay another interesting thing about picture plant is it has this mutualism with that for certain species so it for such coprophagous habit which is utilizing the 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 excrement it produces a special urease enzyme to utilize it okay and in terms of the applied biomimetic materials you have from the super adhesive to the super non-sticky surface so the two extreme inspired from the different kind of macanivorous plant and even this microstructure tube from this peristome structure of the pitcher leaf what is inspired by carnivorous plants and in terms of nepenthes you can see that there are some application even um, on trying to use the enzyme for agro waste uh, for biodegrading uh, the hollow cellulose without heating then also some of the extract are useful against cancer as well and there's effort of trying to make a uh, recombinant protein using this kind of like carnivorous plant for example in Drosera because the protein is secreted out so you no need to harvest the plant so the plant can continue producing the recombinant protein and however the effort uh, much effort is still needed because as of now the yield and the feasibility practicality is not up to the level for an industrial scale and we we found also that there are a lot of bioactivity from the nepenthes extract apart from the anti-cancer you can also be anti-fungal anti-malarial and anti-osteoporotic mainly due to the naphthaquinone content in the picture so in terms of scholarly search on a carnivorous plant uh actually uh i'm surprised that i'm also one of the most prolific for carnivorous plant uh, publications and you know nepenthes actually is not that many publication so um and in terms of pattern search um there are quite a lot of pattern involving carnivorous plant you can see from this and that means nepenthes actually have a lot of commercial values and why i'm interested in the beginning is due to the enzyme it contains inside the picture fluid so that we can bioprospect for commercially useful enzyme apart from other 
important characteristics like the uh, evolutionary history, their structure, their morphology, trying to understand the physiology of its mechanism. Uh, the enzyme actually can contribute to a stress tolerance in other food crop. And some of you might have tasted the lemang in this Nepenthes ampullaria, and it might taste better because of the enzyme it contains that help with the pre-digestion of the uh, lemang itself. However, don't uh, come under heavy harvesting or be threatened in the future. So try not to. <laughs> Hopefully there will be a farm, farming uh, initiative for Nepenthes ampullaria if lemang is in ampullaria is to be used in white um, popularity. So um, as, you, as I show you just now, Nepenthes is species rich and the hybridization is actually very common. Um, to conduct this experiment, we actually use um, Bularia and Rafflesiana that we have grown in, uh, at UKM by Prof. Jumaat. So they harvest it back from Andal Rompin uh, Putan uh, Reserve Forest. Then we have this common garden experiment using this plant. Okay. As you know, omics is very sensitive. So um, we need to control for the sample and standardize the sample. Then that's actually very challenging. And luckily we have this uh, common garden to allow us to do so. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned, these three, why these three species that we are interested in, apart from the very drastic differences in the morphology. You can see this ampullaria was used on the lemang just now. And this hybrid actually have this intermediate uh, morphology between the true carnivore, Raffesiana, and this ampullaria with special character that it can take leaf litter as an input for um, nutrient acquisition. You can see the fluorescent from the picture fluid also intermediate for the hybrid. And you can see the picture, the peristome fluorescent. Okay, so all this character is like intermediate, including the lead position. You can see this fully covered, the, the angle of it, and this open so that it can capture the leaf litter. And for those that are curious about what is inside, it actually got two zones. The bottom have these digestive glands known, and the fluid known as digestive zone, whereas the upper part have this waxy layer that prevent the prey from escaping. Okay, so to conduct uh, the transcriptomic and metabolomic and proteomic work, we have to standardize and have to capture the developmental stages. So, so we have chosen the picture before opening or just one day within picture opening. So the student have to go and monitor at the plot daily to see when we start open and, uh, and straight away collect the sample. So that is the great challenge for the student. Then for the metabolomic, we choose the one week after uh, opening so that it's fully mature, the picture. And we observe the lifespan also intermediate for the hybrid. You can see the lifespan for Ampularia, which is on the ground, is last longer than the true carnivore of Raffesiana, that less than three months only before senescence. So our aim actually is to bioprospect, to study the effect of natural hybridization in the expression of biomolecules and try to elucidate the molecular mechanism of carnivore physiology in the picture. So this is our research framework following the one that introduced just now. And for the first part, which is proteomic informed by transcriptomic, so basically we, in, we use the transcriptomic analysis as a database, sequence database to identify the protein in the picture fluid. And we use the PET bio sequencing for the uh, isoform sequencing for the full length transcript. Then we combine with the uh, label free protein uh, analysis using OPTRAP to do integrated analysis. And we have found uh, various protein related to various gene ontology. So the numbers here represent the three different species. Like blue is Ampularia, red is the Raffesa, and here is the uh, hybrid. Sometimes the hybrid can have a lot more transcript than the parents themselves. 
So this kind of like points towards um, hybrid biogas. That means hybrid is more, is better than uh, the parents. So in terms of proteomic profiling, uh, these are the approach and I'm go not going to uh, describe. And it's another challenge for proteomic research because uh, the picture fluid, um, the protein in the picture fluid is not uh, in high concentration. We need to be able to concentrate it and extract it. So it will harvest various uh, many samples and also we have to collect it at the right time. So that's another challenge for a student that take quite a while for them to collect all the samples. And as you can see, after running on the SDS page and silver staining because of the low concentration, we need to use the non-mass spectrometry uh, compatible uh, silver staining. You can see that the, even the hybrid also sharing some of the protein from each parent. So after we done the profiling, we, we found, we I managed to identify more than like around 220 proteins. This is like the most ever identified in any Nepenthes species. Many of which are unknown before that could be in the picture fluid. Uh, among all, there are actually 25 common protein in all the three species. And these are all mostly uh, reported in the past. Uh, actually, the omic study in Nepenthes is not started since until 2016 by Roloff et al. So at that time, we are also quite um, advanced in the sense that we, we follow and we do the omics fast. However, this publication only recently published in 2012, even though we started the work quite a while back. And from there, we can actually compare between the species to look at what is present in each species. Okay, apart from proteomic and uh, transcriptomic study, we also perform the metabolomics profiling of the picture from the uh, same uh, different picture because of different stage. And we try to compare the metabolite composition and the result is similar in the sense that uh, the hybrid is more similar to the Rafflesiana, just like the morphology. So I can see this PCA plot this hybrid is close to the Rafflesiana than the Ampularia. And we have managed to identify 223 metabolite putatively. The most abundant one is actually high uh, flavonoid. And we managed to find one astragalin, which is one flavonoid to be a chemical marker to distinguish between the three species based on the abundance. So uh, from the from the different metabolites that we identify, we perform this pathway mapping to see what kind of pathway uh, related to those metabolites. And we can also map onto the CAC pathway between, uh, using the uh, transcript and also the metabolite. Okay, that's the advantage of the integration of different omics. And what we learned, this is what is known uh, from the previous study that there is this terpene alkaloid flavonoid in the picture, which produce uh, these aromatic chemicals also for the pigment to attract the prey. Then you have this plumbagin, doceron, and this methyl doceron. Actually, it's kind of like chloroform to human. It actually makes the prey dizzy. So they were confused and drowned into the fluid. So that's how they die. <laughs> okay. And then they see epicuticular uh, wax biosynthesis for the waxy zone. So in terms of the uh, signals in uh, transduction is very important because a lot of enzymes are secreted upon prey induction. So there's no prey, then less protein. When there's prey, actually the fluid become more acidic and there are more enzymes secreted into the picture fluid. Okay, so the acidification. Then there are different types of uh, nutrient to be digested from the prey, like the polysaccharide, protein, nucleic acid, and the lipid. And there's a different kind of enzyme for different stages. Now you have this um, uh, gluconase and chitinase for the, the prey chitin, the polysaccharide. And then you have the protein like nepenthesine and neprosine to break down the proteins. And you have this uh, serine carboxy peptidase for the further uh, digestions of it. Okay. And for the phosphate, uh, phosphatase and lipid transfer protein, all these 
contribute to the full digestion of the prey. And then all these are taken up through an absorption mechanism. And this is what is known. Then we have this defense also. There are actually re uh, reactive oxygen species being produced by peroxidase and catalase. Also, taumatin like protein for defense to kill the protein. Then the pathogen related, a pathogenesis related protein to try to kill other microbes that try to compete for the nutrient in the fluid. And there are jasmonic acid involved. And we found some new enzyme, uh, new protein related to FCC acid signaling also. That is something new that we discovered. And also we discovered some genes related to secondary metabolite biosynthesis inside the fluid. So from the different uh, study that we conducted from proteomic and transcriptomic, we actually add to many new protein that like you see here. So these are the new ones that we have uh, found. They are not found previously. So 220 protein and 223 metabolite. Okay, all these need to be compiled in the database so that people can access and still a work in progress now uh, taken over by Dr. Sarahani in this uh, what we want to compile all the omics data that we have in Imbalsys and we try to store, analyze and automate the research using this portal. Okay, apart from profiling work, we actually study the dynamic of the protein changes in the Nepenthes species, uh, how whether the protein is replenished when it's depleted and how it affects the transcriptome in the picture if that's the case and whether the protease activity is affected by the uh, protein depletion. So from this study, we actually discovered a new aspartic proteinase, nepentacin 6 that we call it. And from the study of the transcriptome, we perform quite in details it, how it changes if we deplete it of uh, uh, the protein from the fluid. We basically filter out the protein and put back the picture fluid and to see how, what changes to the picture transcriptome during the process. And this is a summary that we found that uh, normally, so this is upon opening where we collect the fluid and filter and put back. After three days, we collect again. You can see that uh, after three days, the lid is flexed open, the peristome becomes fully developed, and all this is reflected by the transcriptome analysis. And also the wax biosynthesis all are upregulated the genes. Okay, and then all the protein related for defense and stress are all uh, upregulated. However, if we deplete it off the protein, we notice that uh, there is a shift in terms of the investment of the gene transcription in that the photosynthetic genes and also those involved in energy metabolism actually downregulated. So um, the picture actually know that it lost the protein it has secreted before opening. This is amazing and it leaves us a lot more questions to be investigated actually. Okay. And that is on the transcriptome of the picture. But how about the picture fluid composition? So on day zero and then after uh, we are doing anything on day three and after depletion and then collect it again on day three. So we compare the sample. And we found that um, the, the activity of the protease actually is maintained. So this is the protease activity. So on day zero, compared to day three, actually there's an increase. That means the, the protease is secreted more during the opening and the protease really has increased. For those that already filtered out on day zero, the protein, actually the activity also can be maintained same as the control. That means the enzyme it losses, the protease loss, actually re-secreted, reproduced and secreted into the fluid. This is what we found amazing. And in the while, on day seven, the, the protease VEP increased further. So as the picture mature more and more, the protease activity become more and more uh, higher. Okay. So how we translate this in the application, we look at the enzyme. And one of the nice enzymes that we are interested in is the post-proline cleaving enzyme. 
and nephrosin actually is that kind of enzyme that is a, a new one um, that can help to detoxify gluten. In gluten, it contains this highly uh, resistant to uh, digestion kind of gladin. So this gladin fragment produces this uh, it becomes a immunogens to those with celiac disease because for this genotype they lack a um they have this special uh, receptor to to this epitope of the 33 mer of the gladin it will lead to this inflammation of the villi or the intestine and lead to the degeneration of the villi until it causes mal malnourishment because the loss of the villi for the nutrient absorption. So the only way for patients with celiac disease is to avoid gluten totally so that they don't get this discomfort. And actually it's quite common in Malaysia. I see it could be under diagnosed for one in 100 people. Sometimes when you eat bread, you feel bloated, that you could be sensitive to gluten. And it's more prevalent among the Chinese than the Malay in Malaysia. And there are also emerging occurrence of non-celiac gluten sensitivity in the non-celiac disease population, especially in the middle-aged woman. And this could cause anemia and also osteoporosis. So if you are one of them, then you have to avoid eating bread. <laughs> okay, so these enzymes have various applications in the supplementary uh, enzyme therapy, functional probiotic, food processing, bakery, fish stock, and supplement. Also as a proteomic tools to study histone um, regulation. So I think uh, this is also currently what we are working on. While working on this, we uh, perform a more detailed structural study of the nephrosine. And due to the hard work of uh, Ting, another uh, of my PhD student, we managed to discover its uh, structural uh, regulation on how the mechanism of this novel protein works. We always thought that it's a proteoendoprotease, but from the structural study, we actually found it to be a glutamic pe peptidase. So if you are keen on this, you can read this article free by scanning this uh, QR code. So we found that it nicely fit the gladin fragment and bind the two active residue of uh, glutamic acid 60 and 169 nicely fit to the proline residues and forming a pocket for the binding and the catalysis of the hydrolysis of post-proline residue. And we are grateful to use the alpha fold tool from the Collab initiative that allow us to access this during the pandemic when we cannot come to the lab. So what other further implications from this work? Um, it can be used for comparative genomics uh, study from the profile of the proteins and to understand the regulations so that we can get a better bioreactor for plant protein. So I think we are running low in time now, it's already 3.42. I'll just briefly skip through the third story on the Garcinia. So Garcinia is mangosteen. Uh, mangosteen is the queen of fruit and everyone loves it because of the unique taste slightly uh, sour. And we actually have the genomic and function genomic work done on mangosteen. In Malaysia, we have a common mango, mangosteen called a mangis, and also the mesta, which is preferred because of the flesh is crunchier. And the difference is be between the shape. One is round, one is more oblong. And we have performed some profiling for the mangosteen fruit ripening. Also the cytogenetic analysis and the genome actually quite big, around 6 gigabase and it's quite complex and heterogeneous, hence we are still struggling to get the draft genome. However, we managed to uh, get the organelle genome, the plastome and mitogenome. This will work in collaboration with the National Institute of Genetics Japan and also UMS with the student Ching Ching. And it's currently under review. And another interesting thing about mangosteen is its gasnia type germination. You notice that in the seed there is no embryo. Very, very unique because normally a seed should contain embryo, but however, gasnia type of germination is that there is this only procambium ring present, 
And during germination, the radical and the pumule, the shoot, come out from the opposite end. Just like that. It's like uh, in, in vivo uh, organogenesis. Like tissue culture, it just straight away come out the shoot without embryo at all. And we actually studied this uh, time cost analysis of seed germination by profiling the transcriptome, looking at how it changes, and also mapping onto the seed net from Arabidopsis. And we noticed that day three actually is a unique point for the transcriptional programming, and we count the summary of the molecular physiology. So apart from that, we also have uh, uh, my group also have other study for the crop improvement in Arabidopsis. Papaya, uh, papaya work in yes, tissue culture, the one just now, and also the, the one using transcriptomic approach to study after the RNAi suppression. We have the collaborative work with Prof. Zamri with the PhD student on the drought or salt resistant rice with tissue culture. Work with Prof. Juan Julian with on the Rafflesia flower development and senescence. Uh, work with Dr. Ng Chan Leong on Pratom. And also, um, Dr. Yu Chai Ting from uh, Forest Research Institute on the uh, temperature effect on Katong. Uh, plant in Biomimetic with the director in Biosis, uh, Prof. Jetty, on the glucosinolate biosynthesis pathway. And currently, work with Dr. Sani on the Matissa uh, Plana uh, co expression analysis, a gene network. And with um, um, also work on tomato um, and plant pathology with Dr. Hamidun and uh, a review with uh, Mr. Uh, Faiz. Then uh, with Prof. Mukram on the glycomics, on the vessel stem root disease, on the Ganoderma boninensis profiling of the glycomic, and with Dr. Ayn on the grouper disease with drosis, with uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Liam Moy from University uh, Tungku Abdul Rahman on the muslinic acid uh, treated cell. So just to summarize my talk today, the integration of transcriptomic and metabolomic allows gene profiling to illustrate the biosynthetic pathway of targeted compound. So this kind of transcriptomic uh, enable comprehensive study of plant molecular physiology such as metagenic elicitation, citamination, and panomics or multi-omic approaches provide a holistic understanding for future plant carnivory with more to be discovered from the excellent plant. So there is more and more uh, important to realize the commercialization and innovations via translational application of omic research to industrial problem. So uh, lastly, I want to thank everyone at Imbalsis, all the staff, all my collaborator, colleagues, uh, uh, past and present and perhaps future collaborations. So, uh, and also uh, the lab I visited for my research attachment in Japan, uh, the lab that invited me for a short visit that we work together and everyone, and especially thankful to my research mentor, Prof. Emeritus, Dr. Noma, who has started all these three uh, different projects and I was just continuing it and with her help and guidance, I managed to achieve so far in the 10 years time, I think 2012 until now, 2022. So this talk summarized my 10 years of research. Okay, and last but not least are all the students that have done the work of all these projects. And with that, I would like to promote CODA. <laughs> Before I end, I want to promote the services. <laughs> That offered by Institute of System Biology. So actually we provide uh, the different platform of data analysis from genomic, metagenomic up until biomimetic and metabolomic and proteomics. So you can get in touch with the PIC, like for example, Dr. Imelda, that you heard her just now, or, or Madam Intan. And for proteomics, you can get in touch with uh, relevant personnel and biomimetic as well. So, and the workshop that you saw in the video just now, we have various workshops this year. So you are welcome to join. And I have two, one on the transcriptomic in July and also QPCR in July. So with that, I thank you for your attention and welcome any questions. That's all from me. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
Yes. Oh. Okay, now that. Thank you very much, Dr. Go, for the very fruitful and insightful sharing of your research. Uh, the ten years, ten years, ten years research, is it? Yes. <laughs> twenty twelve until twenty twenty two. Yeah, we should make a special occasion for you for this <laughs> ten years. <laughs> Okay, so let's go to the Q and A session. Uh, okay, we have. Uh, okay, well, I just read a question first before going to some of the questions that I have. Okay, so from Dr. Sarah Hani, uh, she asked that do the gene and protein expression correlate in the constructed carnivory mechanism in Nepenthes? Okay, thank you, Dr. Sarah Hani, for the question. For the profiling of the protein on the three species, we are not doing quantitative transcriptomic. We are just profiling, so it's more on qualitative from the pet bio research. However, we did do the uh, transcriptomic profiling in the Nepenthes ampullaria for the dynamic changes, and with that, actually, some of them are correlated, some are not. So um, there are various mechanisms apart from the transcription mechanism are involved in the protein secretion. Actually, I think that's explain why the uh, the correlation is poor between the uh, the transcription and the gene expression and also the protein expression. I hope that I answer your question. That whereas the carnivore mechanism, uh, that one is from the profiling. The is not from the dynamic. Uh, the study of the protein uh, fluid compositional changes. Okay, and Dr. Ain got another question. Would you like to yeah. read out or I read out? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so great talk from Dr. Ain. She, she, said, she said, so she's wondering why the lemang periukere tastes better as compared to the original lemang from the um from from the bulu, right? Uh, is that due to the enzyme in the picture? In the picture? I would expect so. Yes, I would expect so. And then the enzyme in the picture fluid, some of them contain the protein. So I was actually thinking to do bakery inside a picture <laughs> to, make, to make it detoxify gluten. <laughs> no one tried the idea yet. <laughs> I, I think you could make a business of picture bakery. <laughs> So then you can have the gluten-free baking. <laughs> yeah, but you have to have the specific uh, farm or orchard. Yeah, to, it, it uh, is a good idea, but I, I have no plan to farming for <laughs> this yet. But it could be an idea for others to venture into this. If Lemang Periokera were to be in industrial scale, I think you need to farm it. And I think it's doable. Normally, what what which variety that they use? Ah, uh, Nepenthes ampullaria, the, the short one that can sit on the floor because it won't fall down. It's just nice the shape. It's just small enough. The stout shape, the one that can fit on the leaf litter. Actually, I I suspect it contains some cellulase when when we perform the profiling. However, we couldn't find any cellulase as a novel enzyme. For that and uh, the reviewer commented that it could be from the microbe in the, the, the symbion in the fluid that help with the digestion of the leaf. Otherwise, you could use the enzyme to digest lignin, to digest all the leaf litter to help with the biofuel or the bio waste. So, is it different the enzyme uh, composition uh, between the one? Uh, collecting the litter, the leaf litter, and the one that um uh uh, uh um yes, definitely, the... definitely mm -hmm. it's, it's very different. I can see in the table just now the comparison. There's uh the star mm, the one that I summarized the three species. There are actually a lot of enzyme is not present in one of the species. The ampullaria actually have less uh, enzyme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I will move on to the, uh, this one. Yeah. 
Hey, sorry. Ah, this table on the on the on the right, it compared the three species. Some are present only in Nafesiana, and some are present in Ampularia only, like this Tamatin like, which is quite strange. It's supposed to be present in all. Mm -hmm. And this could be due to the sensitivity of the uh, detection method also. In proteomic, it's very, very often you miss some of the protein because of the low abundance. It could be a stress, but lower abundance than in a certain species. Okay, the next question. Yeah. Okay, so uh, from Dr. Nisha, she asked us to discuss the challenge observed in the terrace cultivation of pitcher plant demonstrated in the study. <laughs> Actually, we don't cultivate it. We go and harvest it. So we have to clear the terrace. I can show you the pic uh, this picture. So this is actually the terrace. After clearing by Akio and Muiz at that time, it's still organized. <laughs> but now it's all bushy again. So uh, the challenges is that you have to keep maintaining it, maintaining it so that you can access to the picture. And another thing is, because it's in the wow, there's a influence of the weather raining can affect the picture volume and the insects definitely we've we noticed that the, the picture always contaminated with insects it's that is to demonstrate it. how how effective is the picture in trapping insect <laughs> there's always insect in the picture fluid so they are not lack of food <laughs> there's actually a lot of food for them there <laughs> in this terrace so the main challenge would be to go and observe and clear the, 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 the plot to, to get to the picture and the continuous observation to get to the right time point. Usually when you miss it, then you, the next day you'll see already open <laughs> more than one day. We try to capture it be, within one day of opening. That's how we standardize the sample before it gets too contaminated. Even when it first opening, already start to get insects so we try to be faster and we actually cover it using the i don't have the picture here actually we cover it with the kind gasser the, the mesh clothes actually yeah it, it, you can see in uh, this before that we use this plastic bag <laughs> Just the plastic will cover it, <laughs> so there's no insect going. We pop some bowl. Then later, uh, students use this the mesh clothes to cover it. Yeah, to try to minimize the insect contamination. So that's another labor. So it's not easy doing omics profiling to compare between uh, sample in the field. So this kind of in vivo study. Uh, it's quite challenging, especially for omics, and it's not in a controlled environment. Uh, did, did you find out that the uh, ampularia, uh, ampularia is the one that collecting collecting the leaf litter, right? Does yes. it uh, also digest uh, the insects? Yes, it is oh. considered as omnivore to me. Oh. <laughs> we call it omnivore because it eat insect and eat the leaf. <laughs> uh huh. Although the the protein composition is different in the, the it contains the proteins as well, but some proteins uh -huh. were not there. We we cannot find a protein in Ampularia, unfortunately. <laughs> so we cannot use uh Ampularia to bake. <laughs> <laughs> the protein is the one that can detoxify uh gluten. Mm, but the one that can be found is Ampularia, right? The one that widely found. Ah uh, yes, ah uh, first and also widely found. They are all very common species in uh Malaysia and also Singapore. The Rafesiana Ampularia are very very common lowland species. They are also highland species, and even the same species that can have different kind of picture. The the one on the ground and the one on the hanging is slightly different. The morphology. So don't be confused. Mm. But Ampularia mostly on the ground, so you only see one type of it. But Lafresiana, sometimes you see on the ground, sometimes in the hanging, it's slightly different the picture shape. Okay. Okay, so next question. Um, uh, is there any from uh, Facebook, no. is it? 
any from Facebook? I think not yet. Okay, but let me ask. Uh, uh, can you uh tell us the challenge of doing the different omics? Uh, in terms besides besides the cost for sure. Uh, but any other challenge doing different omics and to integrate the data? Ah, uh, sample is the most important thing. The, 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 if you start off with the wrong experimental design, the rest of the thing that you want to do will be difficult later on to write the story. So when you want to conduct or make study, remember that your starting experimental design must be sound. If, if, if not, you're going to waste a lot of time, a lot of money doing it and cannot get to a solid conclusion. Like for example, if you have to compare between samples, you don't want the sample to from different time points. Or you want to analyze the sample, you don't want to analyze it separately. Then you don't know whether the result is because the different uh, time or analysis or because of the biological variation itself. So that is very difficult. You want to standardize your sample as much as you can. So apart from the technical logistic like the cost, the access to equipment, uh, that I would think is the most critical thing for omic study is the sample. Because omic is so sensitive, uh, you have to make sure that they are comparable if you are doing comparative study. So I think the challenge is more if you have to collect the sample from from the wild, not 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 from the glass house or uh, the control environment, right? So yes. how uh, but and in the past, in the past, we still do away with uh, no replicate because of limitation. But now it's harder without replicate uh, to get publication. So notice some of the works that we have published without a biological replicate. But however, later on, all our works are mostly with biological replicate. So that is like the minimum requirement. <laughs> so that is not a challenge. The sample quantity they want to get, especially the roughest, yeah. <laughs> that is a great challenge. That there is no replicate. <laughs> it's very hard to find Rafusia in the wild. <laughs> okay, we have questions uh, coming in. So, uh, from Akin, uh, yeah, he asked whether does the Neposin available in uh, uh, Nepenthes Hukariana, the hybrid? Yes, you can see in the table. Neposin is actually present in the hybrid. So uh, how heat stable is uh, this nephrosine actually? How heat stable? I would expect it to be stable as much as the uh, external environment. One thing that is um, interesting about uh, the enzyme in the picture fluid is that it's exposed to the environment and into a function and effectively, even though diluted by rainwater, exposed to the environment, it still can function. It's even better than our gastric juice. Human, we have it inside the, for the digestion. Yeah. However, for the pitcher, it's exposed to the environment, but it still works. So um, it won't be stable beyond the denaturing temperature, like 60 degrees, all protein will be denatured, most of them. But at least at until 37 degrees is still functioning because exposing to the heat outside is still working very well. The more uh, uh, determinant of the nephrosin activity, actually not the temperature, rather it's the pH. It's acidic, it is activated by acidic uh, condition. So it requires acidic uh, condition for uh, its activity from 2.5 until like 5 pH 5, the range of its uh, uh, optimum uh, functions. Uh, I, okay, so I hope it answers uh, no Isaac's question. Okay. Mm. Any more question? Uh, no question from Facebook. Okay. Uh, Okay, just uh, uh, asking you uh, your opinion um, on on perhaps the mango skin. Uh, do you think is um, uh, what what do you think is the challenge to to conserve uh, or to store the mango skin seed because it's uh, 
not actually a seed because it, it doesn't have the embryo. So, uh, if for propagation, you need a lot of seeds. So it's a good, there's a two side to it. Actually, mangosteen seed, one single seed, if you split into two, actually can make into two plants. Yeah. Sometimes a single seed can have multiple plants. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like a tissue culture, you know. Imagine the seed itself is omnipotent, so it can produce into multiple seedlings from a single seed. It's like an encapsulated tissue culture, but produced by the mother plant. Mm -hmm. So it has yeah, this in vivo organogenesis by default in the soil. But however, uh, one fruit can only have like one seed. <laughs> and this yeah. seed, and this seed, if you were to use it for the farming, you have to eat it <laughs> to clear the flesh. And it's very laborious. <laughs> so um, it cannot be stored for long, as you know, right? Uh, because it's recalcitrant. Most of the tropical plants have recalcitrant seed. That means it, it cannot be stored over uh, like temperate seed, like Arabidopsis. They can be stored over the winter or they need cold, cold temperature for it to be uh, activated because they go to dormancy. Whereas uh, mangosteen never go to dormancy. It remains active from the parent, from the fruit until germination. Hence, we found it very interesting, the reprogramming side. It go into anaerobic respiration, then it start off the germination. So day three of germination, is actually the time when it becomes anaerobic. So when it reactivate and produce a lot of fermentation and it start to trigger this differentiation during that time. So um, in terms of the challenges for the preservation or propagation of mangosteen, I think would be trying to find a better way of tissue culture propagation for the mass Propagation because you can actually produce it from different tissue of the same plant, right? You can get it from the callusing from the leaf, not just the seed, but the seed will be most effective and you can cut it into multiple pieces and get multiple shoot. <laughs> 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 so it's a clonal cow uh, sample, actually. That is a good thing about mangosteen seed. Even though it's uh, recalcitrant, it is actually very easy to be cultured relatively compared to other plants like citrus, right? <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. Is mango seed easier than citrus? Mm, not really. Also easy for citrus. Easy, okay. Yeah. There, there are certain plant is harder for tissue culture, but mango yeah. seed is not as hard as those plants. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Go. Um, Oh, someone just say hi. No. <laughs> Not asking any question. Okay. It's like the 407. Yeah, 407. So, uh, any questions from the floor? No question. Okay, I'll go. Maybe um, just a general one. Since you are already 10 years in your research, maybe any advice to the... <laughs> to the uh, young researcher who are starting to do their, um, to start their uh, trademark yeah. on what, what to go into. Mm -hmm. how, okay. how, how do you go into first transcriptomics and then move to different other fields? Uh, no, you started with biology, molecular biology, right? Yes. Uh -huh. And then you so move on. In 2012, that. I have no experience with transcriptomics. I started off with Arabidopsis study, with studying the, the as you can see in, in the first slide, I was actually mm -hmm. studying Arabidopsis at the University of Sheffield, and I study actually the, even the biomechanic of it, the cell wall mechanic. So I have no experience with omics at all at that time when I joined in Biosis 2012. So just like many of you that started joining in biosis after PhD, we are we are in Malaysia. We are after PhD, there is no postdoc. You straight away have to become a leader, become an expert in the field. So that is a great challenge for many Malaysian researcher. Uh, so you just push to the deep end and then swim. <laughs> <laughs> so my advice would be you have to identify your interest. Don't worry, you have multiple interests in the beginning. 
but you have to pinpoint what is your strength and how you fit into the gap in the in in the in the institute in the knowledge or your how how you can sharpen your skills or add skill in my case uh, at that time in biosis is uh, lacking transcriptomic expert so i i'm interested in this kind of gene expression also because i work with the uh, gene expression study before so i then i make effort and learn it all by myself proactively joining all these courses like going to BGI to join the AMBO practical course, go to the TGSC in the UK also for the workshop. And all this helped me to develop the essential skill needed for the transcriptomic uh, analysis. And technology keep moving, omics keep moving, the field also keep changing. 10 years ago is very different from now. 10 years ago is so easy compared to now to get funding <laughs> <laughs> 10 years ago was so rich <laughs> so much money you can get <laughs> to to explore your interest but nowadays it's very very difficult so uh you have to be careful with that and most importantly as a young researcher is uh the miss uh you have to be careful in choosing the students student is the most important asset that make or fail you because <laughs> your KPI is the student, your research is the student. So everything is, you have to guide the student to do so. It's not you doing it yourself. You have to train the student to do the work that you propose to do. So that is, I think, the greatest challenge for any new, uh, new researcher or new, new, new staff. They have to, from a student, become a teacher and mm -hmm. they have to overcome the stress of frustrations in training people. I think that um, sometimes needs some counseling. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think the, you have to prepare mentally that these kind of things happen um, and be resourceful, most importantly. Build your network. Uh, new one also from the previous one, your last time when you study together, you might have friends. Just like the student now in Basis, all your friends, are actually your network in the future. So all the network that you build, going to, going to conference in the past or future conference, all that will help you to guide you into directions like what you were interested in. You might change directions from what you have studied before in the PhD, but if that's what you want in the coming years, you shouldn't be afraid of trying the new things. Yeah, that, that, that would be my... Um, my comment, my, my, my advice to the new researcher, but you need to have a target. Otherwise, you will be lost. <laughs> and don't envy on others. Don't, don't envy on others. If you envy on others, you will be very stressed. You have to set your own goal, set your own pace. You don't want to put unnecessary stress on yourself by looking at others as I had achieved. Just like what is common in life, right? Different people have different goals in life, so you shouldn't compare yourself with others. Same for uh, academic also. Some just need more time. And if really the case, they have to work harder. And at the beginning, I have to work very late. I am always the last person to leave the institute, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have to work extra hard. I think uh, that's since PhD, I think. Uh, when I work, I work like, I put in effort to do my best for everything that I do so that I won't regret it later. Uh, that that always the, 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 the way on how I do it. I also plan ahead also and knowing uh, how, what, when time to relax, time to travel <laughs> and then focus work and when it's working. Uh, yeah, you have to have a balance. Otherwise, you will collapse. It's a marathon. Academic life is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You cannot like work very, very hard continuously. You will break down one day, you will burn out one day. You have to think that this is for coming future. Your, your future career is going to be over 20, 30 years time. Okay. So you how you move towards that and you have to plan ahead. And you don't work too hard and don't stress out. But if you really think that academic is not suitable for you, it's still not too late for you to try find other options from the industry. 
Yeah, even though the industrial job is quite limited in in Malaysia, but you can you you have to try and reach out to 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 find more opportunity out there because you are not restricted to just an academician. You have many skills. As a young researcher, it's time for you to sharpen your skills and explore what you really want in life. Yeah, same for the master and postgraduate student as well. When you are doing the research, you know the research skill that you need. You have to be good in writing. You have to know the knowledge domain. But doesn't mean that you will be a researcher in the future. It's the way you conduct your research, the attitude, the how you your inter relationship, your interpersonal skills, your communication skill, all these additional skill that make you you during the postgraduate study. And same for academician also. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm very senior. I'm also very learning all the time. And there are a lot more caliber researcher out there. And I'm just doing my best for whatever I can. And as long as you are happy with what you achieve compared to yesterday, you are learning or getting better every day, then you should be happy and congratulate yourself or give a pat on your back. Don't be too hard on yourself uh, in, in, in the academician life or in the researcher life. Yeah. I hope that answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, a lot. Uh, very lengthy advice. Yeah, we have we have plenty hands here. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Go, for the for the sharing uh, of on your research and also the tips and advice for us to the for, for the young researcher. So I think uh, we uh, come to the end of our session. Wait a minute, where's my cursor? Um, so, um, I would like to thank Dr. Go for the very interesting research topic and I'm sure it has opened up our view and give you an idea on how uh, we, we want to bring our, up our research output to the next level. So today's webinar have recorded um, participants from uh, Webex 57 and FV uh, 21, so in total around 78 uh, participants. Okay.